10 holes on the on the bogey train, so to speak. Um, kind of made it hard for me to recover and I ended up finishing in the middle of the pack, but my game is generally feeling pretty good. That's good, yeah. Oak Hill's a very tough test. If any of you have watched that event or played there, uh, it's an extremely tough venue. Um, one thing that caught my attention while watching the coverage, uh, Adam has played an extraordinary 87 majors in a row. <laughs> Does anyone have any idea how good that is? I think there's multi levels to this one. It's not only like the physicality of it, like not injury, injury free to be able to play 87 majors in a row. Uh, I did a little bit of quick math. I think that's 21.75 years in a row he's played in majors, which is older than all of the juniors playing in this event here today. <laughs> Sorry about that, Adam. <laughs> You're only dating yourself as well, because Matt, we do have a long history. We played junior golf and amateur golf together, and that was in the 1990s when he talked about us coming over here to America, so something not many of the juniors would know about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, definitely. And I think another thing that pride, you used to pride yourself on was being in the top 10 in the world for quite some time too. Do you know how many years that was that you were actually in the top 10 in the world for? I don't, but it's been a while since I was in the top 10, so maybe this will motivate me to get back there, give it to us. Yeah, let's hope so. Who wants to motivate him to get to back to top 10 in the world? Well, maybe even number one. Okay, so we'll just run through a quick rap sheet so everyone who doesn't know who Adam is, he's a 14-time tour winner, the 2013 Masters champion. I mentioned before about the majors, but he's had 31 professional wins worldwide, uh, former number one and he's had an incredible 10 President's Cups appearances, which is also equally impressive as the majors. So, welcome Adam, and um, while, uh, while you're warming up, why don't you just tell the kids here what you're working on in a swing at the moment, and maybe what you're looking to do next week at Memorial. Yeah, yeah I'm heading up to Memorial Tournament on Monday, so we're kind of really right in the middle of the bulk of the season, and uh, I'd played three events in a row, finishing with the PGA, I went home, I live in Europe, and I was home until yesterday. And uh, so I've had five days off golf. So these are the first balls I've hit since the PGA, um, which may or may not surprise you all because you can't play every day all the time for your whole life. Um, and you've got to kind of find your time to take a break. So this week was kind of an off week for me. So coming to hit a couple of shots, I'm just trying to find a feel for the club base. But as far as what I'm working on, generally in my swing, at the moment, I like to keep things fairly simple. I don't fill myself with too much technique, but posture is an important thing for me. Everyone thinks I always have nice posture, but it's a, one of the hardest things for me to maintain. When I set up to the ball well, I generally swing pretty well. So I like to just have my hips activated. And that's what I should think about here, hitting my first few balls back after some days off. Make sure the hips are nice and activated and then you kind of get that nice straight back that you can turn around. And uh, really, for me, getting a little bit older, you know, keeping the body moving is uh, a big focus. It's really easy for all you guys, young, supple bodies. I'm, I'm jealous of the way you guys get to move through the ball. It gets much harder as we get older. And uh, I work pretty hard physically in the gym and with uh, trainers on that kind of stuff, therapists. But then I want to use that in the golf swing. So keeping it a very free movement is important for me. And again, that kind of my focus is on the hips moving good through the ball. If they can clear, the rest of the club catches up and I hit it. So it's not really, it's not really a swing thought. It's just more about being very free with <laughs> not not getting in my own way to hit the ball. Yeah, that's some good advice. I think someone that has played as successfully as Adam for as long as he has, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. He keeps it extremely simple. I know we're all guilty at times of working on our swing with our coaches and trying to get a little bit too technical, but you know, hearing Adam speak here, it's quite refreshing to hear him say he's focusing just on his setup and his posture, and that allows him to swing freely. Just like that. This is, this is a... Uh... 54, and I usually would start um, a warm-up pitching a few shorter ones, but because I'm in front of you guys and I haven't hit a shot for five days, I didn't want to chunk a few <laughs> in front of you. So I'm hitting them longer at the moment and just trying to get a little more warmed up. I've never seen you chunk a chip. 
I think just to the, another point there, you mentioned about how you work, do some stuff in the gym. Um, having spent some time with you, I can speak to that. And this, you know, I'd like Adam to speak to, he's probably being a bit, a little bit, uh, um, how do I describe it? He's, he works out a lot more in the gym than you might think. And I think obviously he takes, he takes care of his body. Going back to those 86 majors, looking after your body is paramount. So, you know, I think these days, if you're not working out in the gym, um, and you would have seen it with Tiger and VJ, right? Working out in the gym and when you were growing up and starting yeah. to play on tour. Yeah. And how important that is. Yeah, look, Tiger changed everything. He was, he was uh, this new benchmark as we were getting into college age and being out of junior golf. Tiger came along and he changed, changed the game. And uh, certainly fitness plays a big part. And it, it is a big part of why I've had a long career, injury free and still able to kind of play, uh, I, I like to think at the highest level, but I at least generate ball speed like some of the young guys still do, so it keeps me relevant, but um, a, a lot of work goes into that, and it's it's a balance, of course, everybody's different, you know, I think Tiger pushed it to limits we'd never seen before in golf, and his achievements were incredibly high, and uh, we've seen Rory kind of push it up to those levels, and transform his body and get incredible results and uh, I think you know there's a balance in it for everyone for young people I definitely encourage uh, the idea of starting to understand fitness and a general routine but while you're still growing um, I'd also say be really careful of pushing it too hard too young there's plenty of time but the discipline of adding another routine, like a, a bit of gym and general fitness and strength uh, is very good for the game of golf. Any, anything that's got some discipline to it, I think really helps the mental side of the game when you're on the course. Even if it's just knowing that you've done everything to be prepared for your next round uh, is a good feeling to go to the course knowing I've, I've done my practice, I've done my gym, I've done whatever I think I need to do to be ready. That's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, valuable advice there. I think even too when you travel as much as you do too, from plane to hotel and sleeping in different beds, making sure that your body is uh, able to uh, cope with the demands of travel, uh, I think is very important as well. Well, are we ready to move up to another club yet? Is he warmed <laughs> up? Or is, I think he's just, we need to uh, jump up a few They were clubs. feeling good, the wedges. Uh, yep. I, so yeah. If anyone's interested, 54 degrees, and when I'm fully warmed up and kind of playing on the course, 120 yards is about what I hit that. That's with nice control, not too much spin. And what that's club fun. have you got now? This is, I went to eight. Eight, that eight. Right? okay. Yeah, that's fine. Shall we put some pressure on him, give him a target to aim at instead of just hitting it anywhere? Okay. That's pretty nice. So we've got some questions, but while you're just sitting here, uh, I've got a question for you. What do you think uh, separates you from the rest of the world and has done for the last 20 odd years when you're out there on tour? What is one thing that you can guarantee all of us here that you are better than than everyone else? <laughs> um, it's, it's probably changed at times in my career, but it's hard because I can't be very modest answering this question, but I actually think I'm the best green reader in the game uh, today. I probably, five years ago, I probably would have said I hit the ball the best, but I think everyone's really moved up a level and I've kind of tapered off as I got older, but I think I read the greens the best and I've worked with Matt a lot uh, on my putting a few years ago and uh, I think green reading is the start of good putting. You've got to be a great green reader to putt well. I mean, yeah, yeah. You're, you're a specialist at it, but yep. I think it's a great start point and I kind of pride myself a little bit. It's I, definitely a skill, learning how to read the grass and the terrain that you're on and the, understanding how gravity affects it and the, the grain and the slope and all of that to manage that on top of that with the speed and then try and get the ball to start where you want. But that's interesting you say that. I think it's a skill that you can learn. I think Adam definitely would agree that he has learned that. It's not something you're just born with. There are coaches that can help you with that and Adam has learned that. He's very diligent with that and understanding how to read greens and different grasses when you're traveling from state to state and country to country and how Bermuda grass reacts differently to Poana grass, to bent grass and the like. I've got one little 
thing that I think is your secret power. This is when I was working, fortunate enough to work with Adam for a little bit. Um, it's something that you wouldn't see on the surface, but he doesn't know what I'm going to say here. But when he played poorly or hit a bad shot, which was very rare, or if he missed a cut, which was even rarer, um, I felt that Adam had an amazing ability to forgive himself and forget and move on. Um, do you want to speak to that, Adam? I think there was an example for me when you missed the cut at the US Open when I was working with him. I was expecting you to come out of the scorer's hut and um, be really angry at me. Um, but you were <laughs> quite the opposite. Uh, you came over and said, do you want to go get a coffee? Let's talk about it later after dinner. You know, to me, that was like a true, uh, you know, the ability to just switch off and not let that affect him and move on. And I think, you know, to play the majors that you have and contend in tournaments that you have, you have to have that ability, right? I think so. I mean, uh, look, I've learned a lot. I've played out here a long time and I've failed many times, so many more than I've won. And I feel like I've won a fair share of tournaments around the world. But you've got to learn how to deal with the failure first off, even straight away, when I surprised Matt by not coming out angry from there, how to process it, and then find out what I learned from that bad day at the golf course, whether it was a miscut at a US Open, or I was leading the tournament and didn't win on the final round, and find out. That's the times you learn the most, and then what not to do the next time, how to prepare a little better. And I think most great sports people that I've talked to find they get all their results from good preparation. You know, it's, everything happens before the event and then when you get to tee off, you just go out there and, and think a little less and do it with your instinct if you've practiced and your natural talent. And that's something I remind myself a lot now because I've hit a lot of balls. I've worked on a lot of stuff, whether it's putting, chipping, the swing, all different kinds of things trying to get better but I have a talent and I just should use that when I go and play tournaments. There's definitely a lot of trust there that you know you know mm -hmm. you put in the work and I think that's something that you can all take home today. If you're spending a lot of time working on your on your craft like Adam does, that you have to have that trust when you're out there. I guess that would be the same too if things aren't going well for you on the course during a round. How do you how do you manage that and how do you that's one of the questions here which is a nice little segue. How do you manage that when things aren't going well for you on the, on the round, whether you're not hitting the right shots or you're not quite making the parts, how do you manage to turn it around mid-round? Yeah, that is, that is frustrating for sure because you've done all your preparation and you go out there and golf is hard. Some days you, know, you can try your best and it just doesn't go your way. But, but dealing with it, I developed kind of go-to go -to swings and go-to shots to just manage to get through that day and not completely blow myself out of the tournament and come back the next day or go to the range after the round and work on it. But when you're on the course, you've just got to gather yourself and have some kind of shot you can rely on and trust. And I think trust is the big thing. It's pretty easy to trust yourself when everything's going well and you can fire at every pin and every putt's going in. But to trust yourself when it feels like you haven't played golf for a week and a half or or uh, ever before and they're going everywhere to find one shot that will just get it in the fairway often I just try and throttle way back and you know I, I tell myself things like uh, for example I normally drive it about 300 yards but if I'm really struggling to get it in play I'm like okay this drives only going 230 and it just really slows my tempo down I usually get too fast and I kind of bring everything back in and bring my expectations way back in and try and just manage to get it around. So I have a few different go-to moves, like the slowing down uh, and trying to hit it short. Or if, it, if that's not really the thing to go to that day, I kind of go the ball back in the stance and, it, and move some stuff around to at least start it where I'm looking. So they're things you've got to develop as as you have those bad days on the course, which we all will, to then go to the range and figure it out, what you can do in that case, and then go out the next day and, and see what happens. Yeah, I think there's a sense of, you know, have to adapt on the way around. If things aren't, your body's not feeling well, or the swing's not feeling how you would like, the ability to adapt, I think, is a really high level skill that the top players have in the world. They don't always play with their A game, despite what you might see on TV. And I know that Adam's 
definitely played with his B or C game sometimes and shot some big score, good scores. And I'm sure he's won tournaments where he hasn't felt at his best too, just managing it like he said. So I think that's really important. I think we're just going to go to a couple of questions here from the juniors that are pre-recorded. While you're hitting this, it shouldn't require too much thought from Adam. Good. Sorry, What's your just... favourite on-course <laughs> snack to eat when you're playing? Um, I used to eat a lot of peanut butter and banana sandwiches. My caddy, Steve Williams, he always <laughs> made them and he ate them and we ate a couple of them. Uh, and when he hasn't caddied for me, there's a bar over here called a Bobo's Bar and I eat Bobo's Bars on the course a couple every round. Um, one in the front line somewhere and one in the back. I, I've tried not to get too superstitious with anything anymore because the more you play, the more things. But like Steve Williams has to give it, give me the banana sa peanut butter banana sandwich on the sixth tee and the thirteenth tee, and that's it. We can't eat it anywhere else. <laughs> but the Bobo's bars I eat anywhere. Yeah, I've had one of those sandwiches. They're pretty good. He's pretty particular how he cuts the yeah, banana he, too. He is. Uh, what is the best drill to? To practice staying consistent, this might be a challenging one for you. To stay consistent, you kind of when when things are going well for you, and uh, and and the game's feeling a little bit easier, and and you like what you're doing, then try try not to change that routine too much. Even though you want to keep getting better, use what's working well for you as long as you can. If you can. If you can be consistent with what's been working, then maybe that can build. You know, you, we all get excited when we're playing good and we want to get better and better and better and might go off and get a lesson from a coach and they tell you one thing that's slightly different than that you were doing and you're just not letting that good stuff run its course enough. So although we're all impatient and want to get better quick, I think you've just got to keep doing what's working for as long as you can. I learned something there. I shouldn't chop and change when I'm not hitting it good. <laughs> I love it. That's a good answer. Uh, nerves. Let's talk about that one. How you deal with that? You've obviously been in some high pressure stakes environments. Does anything stand out as the most high pressure moment for you where you really felt like you can't even swallow water, you're that nervous? And how did you manage that? Yeah, I think, I think uh, some of the President's Cups are the most nervous. They're a big deal for all of us, especially the international guys. That We don't have the Ryder Cup, so the President's Cup is a big deal for us. We don't often play in that environment. Playing at majors is like that, but you're playing for yourself. I always say the most nervous I am is probably the first tee at Augusta every year on Thursday. But I, I'm surprised every time I go to the President's Cup, whether it's on the first tee or a big putt, when the whole team is uh, kind of wanting you to hit a good shot or wanting you to hole a putt. I think that's quite nerve-wracking and a bit, a bit different for us as golfers playing in a team environment. But again, over the years, I've done really badly <laughs> being nervous and, you know, the hands and legs are shaking so hard I can't get it under control, but through those experiences I've found ways to kind of slow down and my first thing to do is just to start walking slow and uh, I'm probably walking just normally but generally with me everything gets a bit faster my swing rhythm gets faster I'll walk faster maybe even process things faster just slow down and just see if you know my heart rate can just stay the same at least and and then if, if it's really bad and that's not working, then I start working some breathing stuff that many of you may have, may have seen with some deep breaths and stuff to actually slow the heart rate so that I can hit the next shot. But generally, at this point, just, just going slow. I recognise I'm speeding up the heart rate, so I just start walking a bit slower. That's awesome. I think the key word that just stands out for me is recognising that he's actually nervous. A lot of us don't recognise we're nervous and then not trying to actively reduce that or, as Adam said, walk slowly or slow his breaths down. I'll stay quiet for a minute, let Adam hit a few shots here. We're up to five iron, how are we looking? Those of you sitting behind him, where's he aiming? Is he check his posture out for me? Have you got any thoughts? 
What's your name? Andrew. Can you tell me where Adam's aiming? What does it look like? Just in between the green and the yellow holes. Mm -hmm. Is that what you thought? I've got the draws today. Further right than that? Yes. Gotcha. How about at the green? How's that look? The green. The green side of the green. Oh, yeah, that looks good. It's one of the most challenging things as a golfer is knowing where you aim because we stand to the side of the ball. It's very important for Adam to make sure he's aimed properly. If he's aimed poorly and he makes a beautiful swing as he does most of the time, then what's the issue there? We haven't aimed properly. He's probably going to hit a poor shot. That was a nice one. That was my fade. <laughs> Trying to hit a fade and he hit it straight. Yeah. Inbuilt draw today. That's one big thing when I'm warming up. Uh, if I were to go to play this afternoon after hitting these balls and I'm hitting draws out here, I'll just try and hit draws on the course. I'll just let it happen. I won't go out there and fight it unless I have to slice one or something. And if I don't like the fact I'm hitting draws, I'll work on it at another time. But usually I, when I head to the range, like next Thursday at Memorial, if it's draws, I'll play draws on the course for most of the day. It's just... Uh, you know, it's hard to have a fight out there on a course, any course, especially when they're tough tracks and, and the penalty is, is big for missing. I can vouch for that. I've seen Adam do that before where he may not like the fact that he's drawing it too much, but he'll go out there and accept it and play with it. He might have to change his aim a little bit, but he's managing it the best he can on that particular, particular week. Starting to move a bit better and faster now. Five iron is uh, about 210 yards for me. That's pretty comfortable. So another strength, going back to what I feel like you've done amazingly well, is the ability to hit these four, five, and three irons really, really high and get them to stop on a firm green or a firm and fast green with a front flag, but without losing distance. That's an interesting skill that I think you could probably agree that guys like Rory and DJ and yourself and Jason Day and others have that ability. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think I, uh, as a kid, I had pretty good speed in the golf swing. And um, growing up, I really liked this attacking aggressive style. I love driving the golf ball. And I think I just developed some speed and liked hitting it hard. And that kind of filtered into the long irons a little bit. And I feel for most of my career, like I've been a really good long iron player. Unfortunately, we don't play from <laughs> that distance enough because I think I'd do better <laughs> if we did. But um, <laughs> I've, I've been really lucky. I got coached by my dad early on and I think he gave me really good fundamentals in the golf swing and I think that's really helped uh, with the speed to hit the long irons well and if you look at Rory McIlroy very very similar like a fundamentally very sound golf swing you know he gets quite shallow on the long irons and I think that's very helpful um, you know I don't think there's anything wrong with being a little steeper into the ball with other irons but if you want the best performance out of the longer stuff. I mean, a bit shallower looks very Do all good of you know me. what the difference between steep and shallow is? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So, like, basically not taking divots with the long stuff is better than deep divots. Let's see it. Hmm. Uh, iron right. There's a divot there. I saw that. I don't know if you guys saw, Scotty Scheffler did something with Tiger Woods recently where he's like, how come you don't take divots, Tiger? When he's swinging his best, he just picks it off the top. And again, Tiger was an incredible long iron player as well. There we go. Nobody clapping that one. Can you all do that? <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on up here.
rights and lefts. So you say that uh, when you're hitting draws right now, but obviously there are certain conditions and, and the golf course is going to ask certain questions of you to hit certain shots. You've played multiple British Opens or the Open Championship. Uh, you have to learn how to hit it low there. You might be in trouble and you have to shake one around a tree branch. Uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about shot shaping. I know right now you're just trying to find the middle and hit it pretty straight, but I want to see how you move the ball around a little bit and uh, maybe talk to how you, you go about hitting certain shots. Does anyone have a preference of a shot you want to see first? The high one or the low one? Should we, should we hit kind of up the ladder with the five iron? So really see. low, medium flight yeah. and then yeah. over the moon. Yeah, let's see what we got. How low do you think you can go first? How low? A sting of five iron. <laughs> okay, we'll see what we got. That's pretty nice. That's pretty low for a five. I don't know if it's going to be very effective if it's lower. <laughs> True. You lose a bit of yardage with the spin there. You're going to go a little higher or you're going to go the same? Uh, we'll go just a little higher. So now we'll just try and flight one, okay. not, not so stung. So the ball's a little back in the stands for sure. It's a nice height. Yeah, it is. For a flight. I don't know if it's drawing or not now. Yeah, we're finding out as we go. Uh, move the ball back and now it's not drawing as much. Mm -hmm. So now we'll just put it on a normal flight. Is this the draw? All right, now imagine I'm standing in front of you here and you've got to hit it over my head. Move. I'm not very tall. I think you should move. <laughs> yeah. The ball goes just a little bit forward, not, not too far. There you go. That still had some good yardage on it too. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Let's do that one again, I like that. Yeah, one. maybe I should go with that shot a bit more. <laughs> Nice. Might need that into the 17th or 16th of Memorial next That's week. Right. Is it about that far? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah something like that. So this is now. a new club. This is uh, a three iron. I just put it in two weeks ago. And. Uh, is it like a utility iron? Yeah, it's definitely a bit of help. Yep. Um, and, you know, this is kind of one that. I want pretty versatile. I want a bit of height out of it into par fives so off, the, off the fairway. But I also want to have a decent flight off the tee. So I'm um, just still getting used to it, but it's been going pretty well. It it's, feels really solid. See, you tour players challenge the club makers a lot. You want this club to do lots of different things. <laughs> That's right. You want it to go really high, you don't want it to go really low, but you don't want to have to change, change clubs to do so. That's right. I mean, that, yeah, we, we do get 14, so we can have a few, in, few different ones in there, but it is nice to have some versatility. Yeah. Um, Matt knows me pretty well. I've never really changed my gear that much, but I'm a bit more open to it these days. I think the technology is so fantastic in all this stuff. For example, I've... I was using a Mizuno, one of these, that was really a high-hitting club for a while, and then I, at Hilton Head, there were more irons off the tee, so I put in this Shrixon with um, a graphite shaft in it for like a driving iron type thing, and now I've settled for this for the moment. But, and I have a seven wood as well, which seven. is almost unbelievable for guys like me and Matt to to, uh, I believe. was just talking how good you are with your long lines, and now you're <laughs> telling me you're using a seven wood. Yeah, they're so good though. It's it's uh, so good out of the you know versatility. Bad lies, right? Bad lies in the rough. This becomes a club that you can move up there a couple hundred yards, where you might be hitting a nine iron out otherwise. Nice. Let's see it. And how just how far does this go? Travel. This goes two fifty. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't want the drawers. When Adam goes, mm-hmm, that means he doesn't like it. <laughs> so, to me, I think that's quite a low flight for a seven wood, which is why I like it, because traditionally they just shoot up in the air and they're kind of a one-trick pony and now you can kind of get a flight and hit it out of the rough. This is in the bag every week. The only week this really comes out is the British Open, where you don't want to hit it in the air at all. Yeah, it's good to know. Let's see it again. And it's kind of the confidence uh, builder on the range. I like getting to the seven wood and hitting some solid shots with it. There's the higher one. What does everyone think? They're going to go put a seven iron, a seven wood in their bag now? <laughs> Does anyone use a seven wood here? Anything to make the game easier. Nice. If Adam's using one, a lot of guys, why am I using a, a three iron? A lot of guys line? on the tour are using it at the moment. Actually, Tommy Fleetwood even put a nine wood in the other week. Soon we'll have about 10 woods in there and just a couple of wedges, I think. <laughs> We're gonna open it up to the questions for a couple of the players. Um, any of the juniors here have a question that they wanna ask Adam while he's hitting some of his seven woods? Got one here. What's your name? Nancy. Nancy. Nancy's the first one to put her hand up. She's not afraid of taking risks. I like it. So I have a question about like aiming. Um, so I've people have been saying like different things about it, but basically, do you aim with your feet to the target, or are you doing like the parallel like feet left of the target, but ball like mm -hmm. at the target? Yeah, I've always kind of been a feet parallel person. But that parallel can kind of be different for different people. You've got, to, you've got to learn your tendencies, like on the golf course especially, because that's where it counts, on the range is kind of easy. But when I start aiming left of the target, parallel left, bad things happen in my swing. So I'm parallel, parallel, or it's okay if I'm a little you might call it shut, Slightly but parallel closed. right. Then my swing stays in a good spot. If I get too far left, then I know some bad stuff's happening. And often, if it is happening bad, I, I try and check the aim. For at least 12 years, I always used alignment sticks on the I range. just checked your bag. You don't have them in there. I know. So you don't I haven't been using them for a while. Only... It is incredibly important, but only because I'm trying to get out of the habit of looking at my feet now. Because for 10 years, I just started looking at my feet and the lines were really affecting how I was swinging the club. I was getting a little too into like, am I perfectly straight? And where is straight off the ball rather than just swinging the club? And I'm trying to just free swing, like I said at the start of yeah, the Yeah, and reacting so, to the target. Yeah, yeah sometimes that's And something. reacting to the target. So, like every, everything I'm saying, there's a balance to it all. If you have a stick down for 12 years, you're going to get really into that, but I would advise using an alignment stick. It's one of the basic fundamentals. And like I said, my dad taught me like the basic fundamentals early, and that's always been my baseline with alignment, grip, posture, and ball position. And if they're within a nice area, you can't go too far wrong. Did that answer your question, Nancy? Did. We're going to take another couple more from the, the juniors in juniors here. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Carson. Carson, far away. Um, so I was wondering, what do you think the main difference between amateurs and professionals is that sets them apart? Is there anything that you have discovered over the years that really benefits you or any of the other pros? You mean really good amateurs or just any anybody? Like good players or anybody? Between the uh, amateurs and champions. Do you mean elite amateurs? What separates the, the the ones that want to turn professional, or like your twenty handicap players of the field fillers, and then the ones that are actually winning the tournaments? Oh, okay. Hmm. I I think a lot comes down to the desire to want it and belief in in yourself. If I was critical of myself, the first. Um, 10 years of my professional career, I think I was a super talented player, and I think I wanted it a lot, but I didn't have belief in myself. 
you know, I did the work and I really, I really wanted to win all the big tournaments, but I wasn't performing well in them and it was something within yourself. And, you know, sometimes you've got to go find that and you can get good words from your coach and that fills you with confidence, but there is an inner belief and I think that's the big difference between the field fillers and the guys who are winning is the guy, John Ram, he looks like he wants it. I know he believes in himself, but you can see he really, really wants it. And that's why he's won four or five times this season. You can see it. And uh, if you look at a field filler, like you say, they don't look like John Ram to me. Even if they've got a better looking swing, a better looking putting stroke, some guys do. There are some guys out there who everything looks great, but you can see they're not gonna beat John Ram. Does that answer your question? Let's take a couple more. Go we'll down the front here again. Hi, right, what's your name? I should put it in front of you, should I? Daniela. Good question. Um, so like the week before a tournament, what do you do differently in preparation? And then do you always take a break after a tournament? Yeah, we play a pretty full schedule throughout the year where we're playing a lot of the time, we have a little break. It has to vary because you just can't practice all day, every day. You, you have to have some recovery. And most of the time that comes after a tournament. But I'll kind of talk you through my next couple of weeks because in two weeks time we have the US Open, which is a huge tournament. And I feel like I'm playing really well. I feel like I've got a chance to win that tournament playing well. So I'll play Memorial next week and I'll go from there to Los Angeles Country Club and play a couple practice rounds on Monday, Tuesday, the week before the US Open. And then the rest of that week, I'll do a little bit of golf, mostly putting and chipping. I might play one other time at LA Country Club, but I'll also be kind of using it as some recovery. I'll do some training in the gym and some uh, rest, because then, the next week at the US Open, you go out there Monday, there's 50,000 people at the course. You, your senses are on. You're trying to focus on preparing for a big tournament, but there's a lot of distraction happening. There are a lot of people, a lot of people uh, around you, even practicing, talking to you. And by Sunday, you want to be in the best shape, not tired and that. So there's a real balance. Uh, that's kind of my theme today, is a, is a balance to everything. And that includes school for all of you in school here too. You've got to do some school. <laughs> you had to throw that in there. Because <laughs> I have kids of my own. Yeah, let Adam hit a couple more here. We want to, who wants to see him hit the, the driver? Yeah. Yeah? Talk about some distance. But I know when Adam, just the, Adam's talking about that scheduling, having seen it firsthand, you know, I think Adam will agree. Everyone, he plays best when he's fresh, not when he's burnt out. He's able to make better decisions, his body works better, he swings better, and typically that's when he's at his best. We'll take one more question before we get him into hitting him his driver. We've got any young ones here? Hey there, what's your name? This time I'll put the microphone in front of you, man. I'm Max. Um, you said that you were like the greatest uh, green reader in the, in the world, so what's your process when you read greens? Are you an aim point guy, or how do you go through that? Yeah, I'm an aim point guy. I don't necessarily think you need to be an aim point person to be a great green reader. But for me, it became the easiest way to kind of have a start point to reading a green, a good routine. And uh, I've been doing it since 2014. So again, like, I've kept doing the same thing now for the better part of 10 years. So I'm getting really good at it. And like that accumulation of doing the same thing over and over helps you get good at it. And I do it not to be perfect at it. I do it to give myself the best chance of almost <coughs> making an error. Like if I read the green spot on and I aim the putter well, I have so much margin in my stroke like to make error with the stroke and the ball still has a chance to go in. If I get two of those three elements right, there's a good chance I'm gonna scare the hole with the putt. And it's hard to just make perfect strokes after perfect stroke uh, under pressure all the time. So 
again, it gives me freedom then when I putt. And I think that's a huge thing for me, Matt would know from watching me play closely. Like, when I'm free and feeling loose, good things happen with my game, like getting tense and tight. So I've developed routines like the putting, reading the green, to allow me that freedom to kind of almost feel like I show off then my putting or my chipping or my hitting on the golf course. That's a completely different way of looking at it. Who's out there when they're chipping today or putting today thinking about showing off in front of your playing partners? <laughs> but I think I'm going to try that. We've got a question over here. Anyone got a question? What does it What does it think about the uh, between a shot and shot, the ball striking and ball striking? That's in a lot of uh, timing. What do I think about in between the shots? Yeah. Um, if it's a good one, nothing, nothing much. <laughs> just, <laughs> just try and do that again. But I'm, I'm fairly balanced uh, personality on the course. And I know I'm going to hit some bad shots. So I have to figure out how to deal with a bad shot. Sorry, I'm just going to get out of the wind how to deal with a bad shot and then move on to the next one so I can hit a good shot. And some players can do that by getting mad. And getting a little bit mad I think is okay, but you have to be able to be finished with that before the next shot. I, I just feel like I don't hit that many bad shots, that sounds funny, but in the big scheme of it I'm not hitting that many bad shots. I, I can really accept my bad shot. And I know the next one's going to be good because I've prepared. That answer your question? Thank you. Oh, he's got the driver out now. Well, this is going to be interesting. Is the range wide enough for you today? Just. I'm going to hit it somewhere there. <laughs> okay, let's talk about distance and accuracy off the tee. Having both of those together is a bit of a challenge for a lot of players. Often we try to seek distance gains while we're playing because the game is changing. You're seeing everyone hit at 400 yards now. So you can have a shorter club into the green, which would mean more birdies in theory. How do you manage hitting it hard but trying to keep it on your golf hole? Um. Not sure about how to answer that. He's just always been a good driver. He doesn't even have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of saying there's a balance for everyone, but I think I think today you guys have to learn like a bit of a power game. To me, that's that's where the game's going. Every young player that I see coming out is certainly working on gaining speed, not being satisfied, being average. I think. That's just the way it is. So some of your um, effort in the game of golf needs to go towards gaining some speed. Then it's a matter of understanding how much of it you can kind of control out on the golf course. And uh, it's a huge advantage it, on the days when you hit it long and straight and you've got a lot of wedges in. I think Dustin Johnson, best example of transforming his wedge game to um, complement his incredible driving. Mm. He was an average wedge player by tour standards and he became one of the best. And all the great results came in from that. And I think it can work the other way as well. Mm. Um, you know, I feel like John Ram's really become an incredibly good driver of the golf ball. And, it, and, you'd, and you'll see most of the guys who are great drivers actually hit the ball left to right. I think that's also the modern game. You can still hit a fade and hit it a long way. Let's see a couple. This driver does like to fade it. <laughs> so I've got the hooks. So today, Ian, and Ian where is he aiming? Uh, in between the yellow and the Mm-hmm. Did he hit the fairway? Reload. Left, left side. Unplayable. Left side of the fairway. <laughs> I think that's one. I give myself a fairway there. Okay. 
What about the first hole at Muirfield next week? What sort of shot are you hitting there? Hitting driver or are you hitting uh, three wood? Might be three wood there, but we'll have to like get a little cut, right? Fade a driver. Okay, let's see it. Trying. It's nice. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like to play the golf course on the range? Like uh, like you're doing right now, hitting some different shots? Or are you, yeah. Are you hitting driver? This year before the Masters, I uh, the week before, I was on a range preparing and we'd go through every hole off the tee with the driver. It's such a driver's golf course now at Augusta. And I think I drove a ball really well there uh, this year. And it was fun because I kind of had all the shots pre-rehearsed and I went with it for the week. I was trying. It's one of the few courses that you still have to hit a few shots, high draws, lo lower sliders, things like that. So I think that is a nice thing. But at the end of my warm up, before a round, I always rehearse the first tee shot. That's my final ball before I go. So if it is a three wood, I'll warm up, get to the driver, get through them. The final shot will be three wood off the first tee. How would you give that out of 10? Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> I want to... It's a bit high for me, I think. A I bit like, high, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was good. That was pure. Even I'll say that one's good. Who wants the challenge, Adam, on the tee with a long distance challenge? <laughs> Who? I don't know who. I don't know many of you or any of you, but one of the players that played this morning. Who would you agree that is the, that can challenge Adam with some length? Do you think you need to have your driver with you? Unless he, that, unless Adam's not going to let you hit a spare. <laughs> you okay with that, Adam? Sorry, he can hit one. No one's putting their hand up. Too scared. Right. Well, you guys can. I've got another driver here, so let's hit this one, and then you guys can decide which driver I should use next week. Okay. That was the tailor made. <laughs> now this is the shrimp son. Brooks, Brooks just won the USP chain with this thing. Okay. Let's see it. And the other one's a tailor made, is it? The stealth. Yeah. He's going to get his driver. Okay. We've got a contestant. Yeah. You better keep warming up. This kid's running. He's gonna. Nice. He's gonna hit 400 past you. Oh, we can always be better, can't we? Yeah. Always, it's it's fascinating to me that you've been successful at such a long time, but you're still searching for those little one percent gains and trying to get better, and that just fascinates me. It, um, just never satisfied and I can tell you still love playing the game and love competing and wanting to try and get little advantages over everyone else. All right, who have we got with the driver? Sorry, I've forgotten your name. Carson. Wow, he's got some... Oh, he's got his own. Okay. Good stuff. We're going to spare T. We'll find one. We'll get you setting up just here, obviously, because you're a left-hander. Do you need to warm up? What did you shoot today? 71. And yesterday? 70. Nice, Solid. three under, very good. Solid. All right, so what's the challenge here? Is it an accuracy one or a distance one? Take on the distance. All right, so we're gonna, are you going over the green post, Adam? Can you see the green post, Carson? I'll get out of the way since you're a lefty. So we all stop and watch Carson. Thank you for putting your hands together for him. Let's all give him a round of applause. He obviously doesn't want to be one of those field fillers. He's out here having a go. This right. is good to see. Just a few warm-ups, I think. Sure. Oh, my. Oh, you're in trouble, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> 130 ball speed. <laughs> <laughs> Club speed. Hey, way to put him down, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Does he get one more warm up, everyone? Yeah, yeah. It's easy speed. That's why I yeah. love watching you all swing the club. The body moves so well through the ball. One thing that you have over all, all old guys. All right, let's start this. I'm just making this up as I go, but let's, how about the crowd's gonna determine who hits it the furthest? <laughs> so, cause we don't have track man here. You just all cheer whether you think Adam hit it further or right, no. Carson, how about that? All right, let's go. I wanna see that left heel off the ground, Adam. <laughs> see, what we didn't tell you is that Adam has another gear. Adam was just cruising there, just like with his arm on the steering wheel, just driving down the highway. But he's actually a Ferrari. <laughs> All right, let's see it. That was a pretty good start. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, wow. Well, I'll pay that too. So, crowd, what do we think? Oh, yeah, that pit, not that. Okay. What's the, what's the run out there? Are we in danger of hitting houses? Nah, I pitched on the tee. How far do you normally carry it? About 310, somewhere in there. And how old are you? 17. Wow, very nice. Oh, Bushnell. Bushnell. Okay. Anyone have a Bushnell? I pitched on the tee, easily. Okay, let's see it again. We'll go best of three. Oh, boy. <laughs> 20 years ago, you would have liked this. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. See it come down? Has it come down yet? I didn't, it was behind the sign. I don't know. Oh. It was close. He hit that one just come quietly. On. Oh yeah. Golf's easy. <laughs> so good. You can see why I stopped so playing good. too. Good oh, shot, Carson. Good have a little too much spin for you. This is your last chance, Adam. Otherwise you might not get invited back again. Yeah. I like this high launch stuff he's going with. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right, yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's no good. Easy chance was, to seal it, I think. It was well in. Out of the grid. Out of the grid. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's out of the grid too. We're getting loose now. We're getting loose. So what, is, what do you think the score is right now out of those three shots? 2-2? Two, two? Two, two. All right, I want to hear some grunting and groaning on these last ones. This is the this is the sudden death one, okay? I don't want you to hurt yourself before tomorrow's round. And Adam, you're playing next week too, so nothing too silly. Okay, this is it. Out of ten? It's off the bottom of the club, but go! <laughs> oh, landed up on top. I saw that one. <laughs> Basically, you got to hit this one into the fence at the back there to win. You've got it. You've got it. Easy. Oh, yeah. Go! Damn, look at that thing go. I know, it's so good. Yeah, let's put it together for Carson. That was awesome. Way to go. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm never playing golf with you ever. Awesome. Are you warmed up now yet, Adam? Can we start yeah. the clinic? Yeah, let's start. Okay. Should <laughs> we just hit one with fairway finder? Like, yeah, sure thing. A bit of a go to the tee down a little bit. Yep. Let's see it. Is this the open swing where you got to hit it underground? Yeah, just, or just flat, a smooth one. Flat driver, all of the above. Let's 
kind of like a fairway finder. I think being an efficient driver today is, I think Victor Hovland's really good. You guys see him play a bit. When I look at him, he's like really efficient. I like that he's word. He's 310 in the fairway most of the time. And not trying. Yeah, it's a good place to be. His, <laughs> his go-to swing, like you were talking about. Yeah, he's, in got, the he's got a very uh, repetitive golf swing. He knows what he's doing with it. Out of all the players that you've played with, who impresses you the most nowadays coming up? Some of the some of the new breed, let's call it, the players you compete against on tour. Hmm. I say that like, you, like you're really yeah, old, and I just find I that. Out there. Um, yeah, who's new? Who's, who's new? Um, let's call it in the last ten years. How about that? Last ten, yeah. I think Victor Hovland is going to be really good. I mean, he just finished second or third at the PGA, but he's really solid. Maybe he could use a little bit of your help on the short game, Matt. <laughs> I think he's doing okay. I've seen some stuff he's doing there. Yeah, he's, he's working really hard at it, but he looks hungry to me. He's got the belief and he's got the drive to do great things. He looks really good. Obviously, Colin Morikawa has something special. He's already won two majors in his first few years on tour. Um, I'm, pro I'm forgetting people because they're a good young There's players. probably a lot. Yeah. Um, so speaking of majors, what have we got to do to get you to win another major again, Adam? 80, how about the 88th? That's got a nice ring to it, That sounds it? good. Um, For all Liverpool? Is I'd it? love to win the, I mean, I'm, I'm not being picky, I'd love to win any major, but uh, the Open will be pretty special. I've had a long history with it. I've had a few chances. And it slipped through the fingers, which hurts. But the last few years, I, I would say my iron play has been more erratic than, than ever. And it's starting to shape up a little bit uh, the last couple months. So I feel like I'm trending in the right direction. I wouldn't say I'm for sure going to win one, but I feel like I've got a really good chance at the moment. I'm in a good spot. I feel very confident. And, uh, you know, some things, you need a bit of luck to go your way. And I feel like so far this year, I got on the wrong side of the draw both times. I was out there in the ver really windy morning last Friday at Oak Hill. And uh, it was really tough. It was blowing about 25. And the sixth hole, just for an example, was one of the longest, toughest holes straight into the wind that morning. And I hit a great drive, the longest in my group. Tony Finau was in the group and Max Homer. And I hit a four iron into the green. Finished up the round, survived. It was a battle. It wasn't in too bad a shape. And then by the time I got home and watched in the afternoon, I saw Brooks on the sixth hole. <laughs> There was no wind, you needed a driver and a nine iron in there. So, you know, it can change so much. Sometimes you need a little luck, and I felt like there were a few shots, disadvantage being that morning. I've had lots of good breaks in the draws yeah, too. Yeah, I think but they all wash, wash out in the end. But, they um, do, yeah. but, it, but at the time, even a week ago, it still <laughs> really sucks to think about <laughs> being out there in that tough condition on a tough course at a hey, major. I actually, thinking of that, just came to my mind then. I know when you won the Australian Open at New South Wales Golf Club, you were on the good side of the I draw. I was, that is true. I know that for a fact because I was on the bad side of the draw. <laughs> there was only uh, five guys that made the cut from my side of the draw, which is absurd. So I think yeah. Stuart Appleby was leading that. He was, and he was on the bad, bad side. side. Yeah. It, all, it does all even out in time, but, you know, I, I think the, the more... I, that I keep doing the same things at the moment. Like I said earlier, things are going well for me. I'm trying to just work on the same things, keep myself in the same headspace going to the course, even looking at a little things like my first rounds in tournaments this year have been way better, getting off to way better starts, which sets you up for a good week. So if I can just keep doing that, there's Still a couple big tournaments left this season and of course the end of the FedEx Cup and lots to play for even though I haven't got all the good results that I'd want so far there's plenty to play for. And uh, just on that I think like I said before you've been playing for so long now at a high, very high level and to see you so motivated to continue to keep pushing I think is uh, really impressive and admirable it's something that 
I know many pros and peers uh, look up to you in that regard, the fact that you're still able to be more than competitive and capable uh, with the amount of times you've been in contention. I think it's awesome. Let's take one or two more questions. We're gonna um, uh, wrap it up here shortly. Let's go over here. This little man, he's been putting his hand up all day. Hi there, what's your name? Erin. Erin. Erin, and how old are you? 10. Did you play today? No. What's your question? Uh, why do you prefer fades over draws? Um, mostly with the driver, but I'm happy with fades everywhere. So, many moons ago, to hit it long, you had to draw the ball, because the ball spun a lot. But the balls we have today don't spin very much. And you get a little bit more control with the fade, because it's spinning a little bit more. So the ball will do what it's told a little more if it's fading. It's a bit more consistent, that's all. And like I said, I mean, John Ram and Dustin and all these guys who only fade it, they still hit it really far. So it's not about, you won't hit it shorter fading it. I think it's just a bit more control. Gets them in the fairway a bit more with the driver. Does that answer your question? Yep, I'm over here, by the way. I'm just pretending I'm a kid. Um, I have another question over here. What's your name? Yeah. What were you thinking about during the 2013 Masters playoff? Winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I was, I was nervous, but maybe not as nervous as you might think. I'd been out there playing. I'd already played 18 that day, and I'd been under a little pressure the last few holes, so I was a little nervous, but it was more like an excited nervous, because we started with like 90 guys at the start of the week, and all of a sudden it was two, so I only had to beat one guy. And I was playing well, obviously, so there was confidence with those nerves and excitement, and um, we played some good golf, but when it came down to the the 10th hole was the second playoff hole. I didn't have a very good yardage for that back left flag, but it's the moment. And that's what we're out here for. That's what we play for and we live for. And I went with the harder shot. I took more club that could go over the green if I flushed it. But I went with a little soft fade six iron and it settled back there next to the pin because I couldn't get the seven iron back there. But to me, it was like you go for the win. One, it's one good swing and you win the Masters and that's kind of... Luckily, I was thinking clearly. And <laughs> Great question. It brings me to another point I had written, we had written down here was about strategy. And that pleases me to hear Adam say he was taking on that flag. And knowing Adam as I do, he's typically quite conservative for someone who swings it so, so good. He tends to play away from a lot of flag sticks, which I think um, is really unique. Do you want to share a little I'm trying bit? Trying not to. <laughs> trying to go for more flags now. I, and I, I mean, think I have to, yeah. Yeah, and I think maybe Stevie's influence and, and so forth has helped yeah. with a bit of that. Well, I think the game has changed. A few things I've said as advice to you today, I definitely wasn't given that advice as a kid at a, at a clinic. The game has, has moved along. It's more of a power game. It's a much more attacking game. Uh, and... I did very well in majors for a long time playing very conservatively. I just didn't make mistakes. I relied on my ball striking, made a few putts here and there, and I was always around the place. And par is a good score. And par is generally a good score at the majors. But I think in the last five or six years, the younger players are coming out much more aggressive, and they're very, very good. And when good players are attacking, and there's 20 of them doing that, five of them are probably going to have a pretty good week where their games are on. And it's really hard to beat somebody who makes 20 birdies on a hard course when you're only making seven because they're not going to make that many mistakes even though they're uh, playing very aggressive golf. So I think you've got to be more aggressive, more on the front foot playing these holes. And that's kind of been my mentality the last... Well, this year I've tried to do it. I think. The best I did it was the last few weeks. I played aggressive at Quail Hollow on a hard course. I made tons of bogeys, but I made a, a lot of birdies and I finished fifth. And I tried to do that at Oak Hill as well and it was going good the first couple of days. Um, and then that windy round was hard to make birdies. But the, uh, I, I think 
I've, I'm trying to attack a little more to keep pace with. I think Victor Hovland's a good example again. I mean, he hits every shot at the pin. Sung JM, he hits every shot at the pin. He doesn't ever play away. And uh, their short games are pretty good as well. So being short side in a bunker doesn't really bother them. They just get it up and down and move on. And so I have to adjust. And I think, I think that's one thing as you play more and more golf, you just have to be able to adapt to the elements, whether it's raining, whether it's windy. Not everything is going to go your way and being able to adapt is a big strength. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think it sounds like the moment also dictates that. Obviously, the Masters, the playoff, the moment dictates I want to win. I am going to aim at the flag versus, you know, your impeccable career in the majors. You know, it served you well. Uh, bogey avoidance rather than trying to gain birdies. You know, there's a big difference between that. I think we all sometimes get that mixed up a little bit. We try to go for birdies all the time. And in actual fact, par's pretty good. Par, par does you well, at, at, certainly at certain events. And... Um, what you have to avoid is actually the double bogey. That's really the killer. The doubles and the triples, they're very hard to recover from. I don't mind if you make a bogey and you've gone for it and it hasn't worked out, you make a bogey, you can move on. But coming back from the big numbers, and I think that that's a huge part of advancing your game at whatever level you guys are at at the moment. If you can take that big number away, it's much easier to get better. Let's try and not have sevens or eights or nines on our scorecard. <laughs> Easier said than done sometimes, but great advice for sure. We're trying to avoid the double bogeys. Okay, I think we're probably, how are we going for time, Kelly? Okay, I've got one more question for my, and um, what can you share with the kids here before we finish up? What does Adam Scott know for sure? <laughs> what can you guarantee all of us as it relates to golf, obviously? Um, you can go anywhere with this, actually. Uh, not to get too deep on it, but I think golf is the greatest game. That's what I do know. I think it's given so myself and so many people I know such a great foundation for their life. And it's so good to see you kids out here competing, but just being at the golf course, I think it's a great environment. I grew up at a golf course. It looked very similar to this. And uh, hanging around with the other juniors and having putting comps and kind of being supervised by the members and, and, the, and the PGA staff uh, who took us under their wing and taught us a few things about golf, which I think is going to hold you in really good shape for the rest of your life. And uh, I love seeing juniors playing and being at the golf club and the golf club supporting them as well. And that's something we try and really encourage back home in Australia. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Adam. I'll let you finish off with one more drive. This is the drive for Millfield next week. On the 18th, tough one. Oh yeah, you've got to take it over the bunker. Can you carry the bunker now or not? Maybe with my prodigious new length I have. Uh, after hitting with <laughs> my mate here. Carson. Well, we hope that you, uh, thank you. We hope that you have a, a two or three or four shot lead playing the last tomorrow. Thanks for coming down. Great to catch up with you again. Uh, thank you everyone out here for coming who attended. Thank you for the awesome questions. All the juniors, good luck tomorrow with your final round, boys and girls. Hopefully uh, one day you can be in Adam's shoes uh, playing on the PGA or LPGA tour. And we want to thank also Uniqlo and Hammock Creek for hosting this event this year. And uh,